Mr. Chancellor, Madam Chair, Madam President, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Donald C. McEwen is a native of Saskatoon, where he was born in 1938. He holds a BA in History conferred by the University of Saskatchewan in 1959 and a Diploma in Business Administration conferred in 1962. He came to Carleton in 1963 to work at first as administrative assistant to the bursar, but someone must have seen early in the day the qualities, patience, civility, and intelligence that would make him a central figure in the life of the university for three and a half decades. Four years after arriving from the West, he was appointed Secretary of the Board of Governors, a position he held for more than 30 years. For short periods, he had different titles, Executive as Assistant to the President and University Secretary, for example, but mainly he was Secretary of the Board. He worked for six presidents of the university and served 15 board chairs. Upon his retirement in 1998, the thought that he would be leaving was unbearable and so he was named Secretary Emeritus of the Board of Governors, a permanent designation. In 2004, the university also bestowed on Mr. McEwen the Founders Award, Carleton's highest non-academic honor, for his exemplary contributions to the university. Our task today is to confer on him an honorary degree. The titles, achievements, and projects of Don McEwen's remarkable career are marked by his duties on countless committees formed with his guidance to search for and recommend the appointment of senior academic and administrative officers of the university, directors, deans, vice presidents, and presidents. The duties also included the long and taxing meetings of the board and its committees at which he briefed and advised members. They included, com included commissions of inquiry, tri tribunals, and special committees. They included pretty well all the matters, his duties included, pretty well all the matters that concern the administration of a complex organization. During his long career at Carleton, Don McEwen became the custodian of the university's procedures, practices, and rules, keeper of its institutional memory, and a principal source and sponsor of its wisdom. No one knows as much as he does about our history, our conflicts, and our achievements. Few have contributed as, as much, and few have brought to their tasks such a clear and loyal passion to the university and its mission. He saw Carleton's formation as a work of architecture through which the souls of dedicated men and women were speaking. He imagined as he participated in its growth and unfolding that we, the faculty, staff, and students were engaged in a public and precious trust. I might add that in the spare time, Mr. McEwen served, the Royal, served in the Royal Canadian Artillery, achieving the rank of Major. He was awarded the Canadian Forces Decoration in 1976. Don McEwen's many gifts to the university includes a formal history of which he was co-author and professor with Professor Emeritus Blair Neatby of the Department of History. Titled Creating Carleton, the Shaping of a University and published in 2002, the book starts with Carleton's early beginnings in 1941 when, as the story is told, Henry Marshall Torrey, who became the first president, met William Connor, a businessman, on an Ottawa street. It seems that against the backdrop of the war, the two discussed the possibility of a post-secondary institute of education for Canadians who had moved to Ottawa to support the war effort. That conversation led to more formal meetings in which the idea of Carleton was born and in due course flourished. The book provides a comprehensive and thoughtful record of the major events and players up to the mid-70s. In an epilogue that concludes the book, Professor Neatby and Mr. McEwen say simply, that those who created Carleton, the administrators, the professors, and the students, can take pride in what they have accomplished. To this we can say, Amen, and with pride and gratitude, we add a special thank you to Don McEwen for the unique and indispensable role he played in its past and continuing creation. Mr. Chancellor, in recognition of long-standing and devoted service to Carleton University, I request that you confer the degree of Master of Arts, Honoris Causa, on Donald Colburn McEwen. By virtue of my authority, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts honoris causa.
Thanks. What you need. Yeah. Thanks, boss. Eminent Chancellor, Madam President and Vice Chancellor, Madam Chair of the Board, distinguished members of the Senate, distinguished members of the faculty, fellow graduates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Having attended many convocations, from the time I was a small boy. I worked at many of them, from parking cars to being a marshal of convocation. I was tempted just now, as many of you probably would have wished, to end my convocation address with the words, thank you. I cannot just as it is in the case with you. I have specific people to thank. I did not get here on my own. I have family and colleagues to acknowledge. To begin with, I wish to thank my wife, who has been my companion, soulmate, and friend, and who I met at Carleton as some of you may have met your companion and soulmate. And if you did, I wish you the same happiness as we have had. I would like to publicly acknowledge the debt I owe to Blair Neatby for inviting me to join him to write the history of the university and for all the fun we had arguing about it. In fact, we came very close not to getting the book done on time because we were in the middle of an argument. To all my family and guests who are here, thank you for the contributions you've made to my life. Finally, with great surprise, I must thank the Senate for this honor. When I joined the university in 1963, the convocation ceremony was not as it is today. The convocation address came at the end of the ceremony, not at the beginning. That change came about because we used to have the ceremony outdoors. And after the students got their degree, they disappeared. This embarrassed the university because this, when the speaker got up to give his address, half the audience was gone. The ceremony used to end with God Save the Queen. At one ceremony, the honorary graduate was Robin McNeil. He'd grown up in Ottawa, but had gone off to England to be a journalist and then went to the United States. He ended his career by being the partner with Jim Lair, managing the PBS evening newscast, The News Hour. His convocation speech was all about how Canada had changed while he would, had been away from being a British colony when he left to a robust mature nation when he returned. Once the applause had ended for his convocation address, everybody stood up and God Save the Queen was played. The irony of the situation was not lost on the president of the day. God Save the Queen was never played at convocation again. I must say that I'm much more in favor of the present style of convocation with a master of ceremonies and the student-friendly aspect of the ceremonies. In the old days, this is what guys like me do, is talk about the old days. In the old days, the student name was called and he or she was hustled across 
to the chancellor where the student knelt in front of the chancellor, was tapped on the shoulder, and then sent on his or her way. The kneeling stool that was part of this exercise soon disappeared when a group of social work students made it quite plain that they were not going to kneel to any man. The chancellor of the day was all on their side and the kneeling stool disappeared. In many of the convocation addresses, the question of what the university should have provided the student was examined. The late Professor Corey, who was a principal at Queen's, gave this answer. The distinctive role of the university has generally been described as the passing on of the accumulated knowledge and the wisdom of the past and the adding of new knowledge and understanding to the stock. He later went on and said, the really distinctive role of the university is to make the retrieval transmission effective by preparing reflective and comprehending minds to receive it. Seeing that, re that relatively few students remember a tithe of the specifics they are taught, the credit universities have in the world must rest largely on the kinds of minds produced. Such minds are produced by stretching them and opening them to the unfailing wonders that lie about us confirming the curiosity of the child as the habit of the adult. By limbering up the logical faculties and sharpening wit to see the surface appearance are often cheats, and that under the surface there are myriad relationships in which order can be perceived and confusion cleared subtlest of all and roused mostly by the example of the teacher is a guiding cast of will, a determination to see things as they really are, to suspend judgment until all the evidence is in, to be a friend of truth. I must admit that my first reaction to this selection is my admiration for its literary skill. Such minds are produced by stretching and opening them to the unfailing wonders that lie about us, confirming the curiosity of the child as the habit of the adult. So much said with so few words. It seems to me that if you've worked hard at university to achieve this state of mind, it makes sense that you'll want to sustain it. I encourage you to take your time, take time from your he hectic life to read. And when you find someone that you think is a good writer, Read them again and again and again. In your quest for that which is well written, you will have so much more given the varieties of technologies employed to convey the many messages that will, be, will bombard you. Such technologies have changed the speed in which information is provided and the volume of information available for use in decision making. It is hoped that in this world in which all things are immediate, the knowledge and experience the university has given you will provide you with the tools by which you can quickly find those relationships in which order can be perceived 
and confusion cleared. I would think that given your success to date, you have learned to manage your time well. It is an important skill, don't lose it, because whatever you do in the future, you will need it. One of the challenges you will face in an ever-increasing frequency is to find the patience necessary to see things as they really are. You will have too much information from too many sources. I think it will be difficult to pick the facts to use as evidence in any decision you must make, let alone determine what weight you will give to any of those facts. If I have any advice at all, it is to listen to carefully to what the opposition to your position argues, because it is often it is often you will find in what they say is the germ of an idea that will help you solve your problem. The abundance of information, the mix of its quality, and the variations on the theme offered by any communication process confounds order and makes a mess in which confusion is the normal. These complexities, particularly as they apply to re human relationships, do not come with easy answers. They call for compromises which often don't fit within our comfort zone and may make the resultant de decisions difficult to live with. It will often require a stern discipline of the mind to accept such decisions and not succumb to the demands of one's own prejudice to find a comfortable result. Your time at university has offered you the tools to meet the challenges in your life, in your employment, in your participation in the community, and in your understanding of the factors that sh will shape society. May they serve you well and in the future. However, before you begin this new chapter in your life, let us pause and take a moment to celebrate your accomplishments. My congratulations to you all. I hope that there are all here who are family can share in this moment of achievement with the knowledge that your encouragement and support are also a part of the success that's acknowledged here. My wife, who was one of the original members of the personnel department, used to encourage members of her staff to come and see convocation because it was a measure of the success of their work too. This ceremony is not only about the recognition of the success of each of you, but is also an acknowledgement of the work of every member of the faculty and staff. Speaking as one of those people who often participated in convocations, it has always been for me a time of great joy. As I watch each of you, your family and friends, celebrate the moment of success, may you have many, many more. I hope you will find as much fun in your work as I have in mine. I also hope you will have as much variety and more importantly, I hope you will have the support of your colleagues as I did. Good luck, because a bit of that doesn't hurt. And again, thank you very much.